Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to federal, the Federal Crowdsourcing Webinar Series. Code 7, Crowdsourcing for Code. My name is Nicole Williams. I'm the Communications Director for Code.gov. We want to welcome you all to this talk, which is hosted by Challenge.gov, managed by GSA. Challenge.gov Challenge serves as both the official listing of prize competitions across government, as well as a centralized platform for federal agencies to market their problem-solving events. The program also designs resources and training, which have helped more than 100 federal agencies run over 900 prize competitions with public participation since 2010. Just a reminder to all of the participants that this, this webinar is recorded. At this time, I'd like to introduce our presenter this afternoon, Amin Mir. Amin is co-product owner of Code.gov in the Office of Solutions within GSA's Technology Transformation Service. On the team, he works on a, a range of topics, including strategy, product, outreach, and customer experience to help agencies meet the objectives of the federal so source code policy. Cross-agency co collaboration is pivotal in ensuring that agencies are doing their best to build software in a smart and scalable manner. In his previous work at GSA, Amin served as former program director for performance.gov alongside uh, his work on the CIO Council. He also has previously led teams at the Small Business Administration and the Department of Commerce on Business USA, SBIR, and a variety of other IT initiatives. So without further ado, I bring to you Amin Mir. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you for the warm introduction. I'm glad to be with everybody here on the, on the call or the webinar today uh, on this cold, kind of rainy day in, in DC. I hope to energize you to get you to become involved with uh, software and open source software and uh, collaborating in the federal space is a very awesome challenge. And the Code.gov team is really excited to uh, be a part of that. Um, we're a small but mighty team. Uh, we have a massive mission that, that spans across government. Um, when I, what I'm going to be speaking to you today is a little bit about one of our goals, and that's to bring our government tech community a little bit closer together um, to help one another and to help expose the, the programs and the projects that you're working on uh, to get some help to get a little bit of uh, collaboration, to get awareness on um, you know, the, the really interesting software products that you're building in your respective agencies. Um, so in Code.gov fashion, uh, historical fashion, we always like to start our talks with a, a nice little photo and recap of federal source code in government. So it's not a new thing. Uh, Federal source, uh, source code and, and code sharing has been ongoing um, since the 1940s. And you have a picture here of Grace Hopper. Um, the US labs have been doing a wonderful job with um, open source. They've been working across their, uh, their repositories to help uh, people gain awareness of open source projects. Um, so it's not a new thing. It's a very, it's a very dated thing. But I think um, with respect to the last, I guess, two decades, open source development has increased dramatically. For us on code.gov, uh, let me, I'll just tell you real quick. We started out with around, I think, 50 repositories on code.gov, and today we're up to over 6,000 code repositories. So th there's obviously, uh, they're there. There's a lot of information and a lot of really cool products being built, and we're trying to capture that, and we're trying to share it, and we want you to be a a part of that and help share it a little bit better. So just a little bit of background on what code.gov is and where it came from. It was, it's from the federal source code policy that was published uh, in August, 2016. If you want to know the OMB memo, it's M1621. If you hear, hear me refer to it every now and then, it, that's how we refer to it. Uh, it basically came about because the government spends about $6 billion each year on software, especially custom software. And at the, end of the, at the end of the day, the, the code that is written is the people's code. And uh, code.gov's mission is to enable the public and enable agencies to publish the code that belongs to the, to, the, um, to the American people. 
part of the federal source code policy was threefold. Um, one, to develop source code policy, each agency to develop a source code policy of their own. Um, another one is to update acquisition language to reflect uh, where if a procurement is coming out that procurement officials take a look at what open source po projects are available to them uh, in hopes to not have to replicate and, and um, replicate existing code. And finally, agencies are required now to inventory all their code. And so that's what's, what's coming up on code.gov that you'll see. Um, this is basically a, a list, in a rough sense, a list of the projects that are being built by agencies. And, and, and these inventories are being updated on a daily basis. Lastly, the federal source code policy also said that agencies must release at least 20% of their code as open source. Um, that, that part of the policy was a pilot and it recently expired uh, last year, but the code.gov team is actively working with OMB uh, to hopefully reintroduce that, that pilot um, and maybe make it a little bit more long-term. We saw a lot of success. We saw a lot of agencies uh, working towards that goal and we wanna continue that great work. Uh, it really adds to um, the idea of the government going open source. And uh, I will say this, feel free to ask questions about this at the, we'll be taking questions at the end of this presentation uh, and I can come back and talk on these bullet points if you like. So for those of you who are familiar with uh, Joe Castle, uh, he is uh, also on the uh, code.gov team. He leads most of the work and he came up with a, an interesting uh, diagram about a year ago. It is, it basically showcases all the agencies and their the repositories they had before the federal source code policy and after. Um, and this is kind of a snapshot of who's doing this well. And if your agency, if you see your agency and you're not doing it well, uh, I think this talk will definitely resonate with you and give you an opportunity to uh, bring a lot of what you're doing from a code perspective into light and maybe get help on, on projects that you may need help with. Um, as I said, again, we're growing. We're up to 6,700 repositories. We're very proud about that. Um, and we're also trying to make that a little bit easier for people to access because I'm sure folks don't want to go through 6,700 repositories uh, and so we're working on um, making that a little bit easy from an accessibility standpoint. Um, here's an example of what GSA has done uh, after the federal source code policy. They actually have a, um, a, a portal of their own that they use to showcase uh, what they've been doing for, from, a, from a federal source code policy perspective. Um, they obviously have links to M1621. GSA has created their own OSS policy and they're, they're, they're showcasing uh, the code that they've created in an open source and how to implement it for instructions. I, I bring this up because I think it's really interesting to see um, a couple of other agencies have done this. I think NASA has done this. And we just wanna encourage uh, folks in CIO shops and CTO shops to use this as a, perhaps a model of you know, a, a great way, a, a, great, day, a great, great way for their, the folks within their agencies to see um, what strides their agencies has done to meet the M1621 federal source code policy. So here are some reasons why open source code is good in general. Uh, for starters, you have a higher standard of work. Um, you have a lot more people contributing to your project, and as a result, um, you get a lot more eyes on it, and that kind of falls in line with number four. But it also reduces the friction within the project itself. I've been on teams in the past where uh, code has been emailed back and forth to one another. Uh, some people don't necessarily have insight into the code that's being built. Um, so this allows for a variety of team members and non-team members to take a look at your code um, and perhaps, you know, give you some pointers or just, you know, be transparent. Motivation and recruitment. Um, I like to go about and see what other agencies, even what other entities around the world are working on. Uh, it gives me motivation that to, to see what I can contribute to. It, can, it gives me motivation to see what types of projects are out there. Uh, it's really, really cool. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. If, can people please mute their phone lines? Um, get a little bit of feedback. I uh, apologize. Um, the other, so in terms of recruitment, you can also um, 
a lot of people from a perspective of seeing if somebody's a good coder or not can use uh, open source as a, a way to see like what what other teammates have been working on from, a, mm -hmm. from other projects. Um, and again, lastly, opportunities for collaboration. Um, it, it gives you an opportunity to work with somebody in another agency, uh, somebody you've met, never met, somebody in a different time zone, different technical experiences than you. Um, and that's, that's really, really fun, really interesting, really a great way to learn, in my opinion. Uh, and going back to number four, more eyes, more eyes on the code also means, uh, from a security standpoint, open source tools and software tends to, you know, be scrutinized a little bit more by people who are uh, security experts. So that gives it a little bit of an edge, I think, um, from custom kind of closed source software. So you may not even know this, but you're already using open source almost every day. Um, jQuery is an example. We have. From I've used this, we've used this in a previous slide, but also if you're if you've read the 21st Century Idea Act, you're also using you're also now inclined to use the US web design system for your front end. Uh, that is an open source project. So there are a lot of websites, website being website specific here, websites that are using the US web design system. That's an open source project. It's very intriguing, very unique. Um, and so you're using open source every day, no, even if you don't even know it. A lot of banks do, um, a lot of insurance companies do. So it's definitely something that's, that's out there and it's not exclusive to the US government. Um, I wanted to throw this in there. This is a, an article that we wrote, a, a blog post that we wrote on the 10 myths and facts about open source software. Uh, I can make this link available to you after this webinar but it's really cool to see what people are thinking and what's the reality uh, when it comes to open source. And so I, I encourage you to read this. Uh, we wrote it, um, I think about last year. It's gotten a, a ton of views, some good feedback. So um, go after this webinar and check it out. Now we did, as a part of our uh, strategic planning last year, the code.gov team, Really, we really wanted to know who our customers were, and we took a look at uh, a variety of different. Um, you know, we did some user interviews. We took a look at some analytics data that we had, and we came up with uh, three different uh, user groups um, that we wanted to target. So we have agency liaisons. Those are the folks in the agencies that we work with um, on a daily basis to, you know, bring about inventory and publish code. You have market researchers. Um, they like to find and consume projects. So these are the people who are like scouring uh, code.gov and, and, and a variety of repositories to kind of see what's out there. Um, it gives, you know, it gives, and this can fall in the line with acquisition of, and procurement officials. They want to see what's out there, what projects are being worked on, and, and if there's a way to not have to duplicate. For today's discussion, uh, I'm going to be talking about the developers and the developer community. Um, for us, this is a very important community. It's, it's a, a very talented and very diverse group of folks. Um, and they're, they're, they're there to contribute to open source. And this is, this is really the engine that runs uh, code.gov and it's the engine that runs uh, the federal source code policy. The developers are instrumental in um, getting their projects out there for others to contribute to and also um, having folks look at their projects as, as an aside. So we've listed the top tasks for developers. Um, it's, and you can read through these. Basically, uh, they're actively looking for contributions from people. And this, is, this open tasks area is where we're going to focus on today. Um, they contribute to the code.gov platform. Uh, they contribute to their own platform and a variety of other platforms. Um, basically, they're the ones who um, really do the nitty gritty work, in my opinion. And so here's a snapshot of the code.gov homepage um, where you can find where to explore open tasks. In the past, um, before our little mini redesign of the homepage, we had a button out there that said help wanted. And that's where developers and other folks could go in and take a look at what open tasks were available to them to contribute to. So if you're used to the old code.gov site and the help wanted button, 
Uh, the new one is here on your the bottom left where it says explore open tasks. Um, we've just made it a little bit easier for folks to get to other um, elements of our website and other elements of the, the federal source code policy. So that being said, imagine if we had hit the open task button, uh, it will take you to a page that shows about 65 open tasks at the moment uh, where a variety of different um, people and developers of skill level can contribute to. So right now, the two that bubble up, or the three that bubble up at the top, you can see that this is the, um, the title of the, the project. And you may be asking, uh, maybe asking to yourself, how do you, how do you, how does code.gov know? How, do, how does code.gov pull this in? Um, so we use a, we have an, a, we have an API connection with uh, GitHub where we pull in this information and, and kind of showcase it on our front end being the, the open task page. So if you are interested in open tasks, you can come in here, you can explore all 65, um, or, and here's a closer look at um, the two top two tasks. So here we have it kind of uh, broken down into the type, which is uh, either it's a bug or enhancement in this case, the skill level it could be beginner or, inter or intermediate, and the effort could be small, medium, large, and of course the skill level can also be advanced. Um, the languages is obviously something that was not populated by the, by the person who created this um, repository. It's actually the code.gov team, so we should. But um, it also says what agency it's coming from, the last update, um, and of course the project. So this is a, like, just a little closer look at what we're, coming, what we're seeing today. Now, you can always filter through the projects. Um, for many people, the, we'll probably have more beginners uh, then we have advanced users, uh, but that doesn't mean that advanced users should not be checking this stuff out. Um, the time required, small, medium, large, the type. So it's a, is it a bug? Is it content? Is it enhancement? This is a good first issue, and I'll get into that a little bit later. So I'll just go back real quick and, and talk about um, these categories and where are they coming from? They're actually coming from uh, labels in GitHub. Labels are basically what they sound like they are. They are labels that you put on your code repository to kind of showcase and highlight what, what it's all about. Um, here are some labels that GitHub has as a default. Um, the ones that we're using in this example are bugs, enhancements, good first issues, and help wanted. By default, code.gov pulls in any um, label that has the help wanted and the code.gov label attached to it. These other, issue, these other labels are really good to have because it kind of illustrates your, your task. So GitHub recently rolled out with a good, good first issue. Um, and this is, this, is a, this is basically issues that are good for first time contributors. So people who are maybe new to GitHub, uh, new to, you know, is doing issues, new to commenting on code, um, people who just want to learn about open source, people who want to learn about um, anything that's code related. That's a really, really great new feature that GitHub rolled out. And we are actively working to also pull that into the open tasks. So when, it, when you see something come in in the future, you'll see uh, a good first issue as well. If it's a project that that's deemed a good first issue by the person who is operating or managing the repository. So here are some other ones, um, questions, won't fixes, um, duplicates, documentation. You can always add labels uh, to, your, to your issue or your, your, your pull request. Um, here's an example, CDC's micro tra microbe trace. Um, has a couple issues up, and then here's one issue where the labels that are available to it right now are on the right hand side that say help wanted code.gov. The skill level is for the beginner, the issue type is enhancement, and the effort is small. Um, so I think this is a really cool um, example of um, an agency that's using these labels not only to just highlight what highlight for code.gov, but also as a way to manage the issues that they are seeing on their site. Um, 
Consumer Financial Protection Bureau also does this. They, they've um, also included in their repository here uh, steps to replicate the behavior and the expected behavior. I think that's really, really unique and that's really great for um, anybody who's really gonna have to dig into what the issue might be. Um, in this case, you can see the skill level is advanced. So I think that's one of the reasons why they wanted to tell you what the, the behavior is and what steps to replicate the behavior. Um, but again, look, they've tagged in this label uh, the code.gov and the help wanted labels, and that's how we're pulling it in. That's how we're able to help showcase these, um, these issues in, the, in, the, in their projects. Here's just a, another um, visual of the variety of different labels that you can have in there. The colors, obviously, you can uh, change if you like. So uh, don't take this as a, oh my gosh, it's all over the place. No, um, you can obviously change the colors, but it, it does give people a first good glance as to what they're getting themselves into when they're taking a look at the issues that are open or the issues that are closed. Um, is it documentation? Is it a, what's the priority? And again, the effort and the, and the, um, the issue type are very important. So this is just a, a cool little, I thought, a uh, snapshot of what you can kind of visualize on the GitHub, on, on GitHub, GitHub page. Again, um, sorry for the blurriness, but here are some um, well-known labels, I apologize. So good first issue is one that this, this one is using. So the point of this talk is to get you jazzed up about discovering um, issues on or open tests on code.gov so that you can go in there and perhaps help an agency that needs a little bit of help or take a look at what they're working on and maybe provide some suggestions. Um, and the other is obviously to for agencies to uh, put open tasks on, on, on code.gov so they can, that they can be worked on. Um, we've had issues closed out of the open, open task list. We originally started with very few. Uh, they've grown. The last time I checked, there were 42. Now, as I said today, there were 65. So there's obviously a need. Um, the open source community is you. It's a group of individuals who work together to test and modify open source projects and products. Um, there is no um, slap on the wrist if you're wrong on something. It's a great opportunity to learn. It's a great opportunity to share and to help, you know, get to know one another in a developer sense. So I implore you to grow your community um, by joining the Koduk of Open Task List because um, we have an outlet for you and we want to encourage you to use it so that uh, folks can, can help contribute to your project. Now, open source does not mean no rules. Um, we, and it also doesn't mean no control. So here's an example, here's a quick, quick little snapshot of some projects that have been you know, worked on, but they always re require some kind of level of review. And so here's a little uh, photo of uh, a project or, or, or a pull request that has gone through and, it, and the, the, merger, the merge of this pull request has to be reviewed by somebody on in the internal team. So when, in other words, even if your project is an open task, even if your project is an open source project, um, at the end of the day, it's the responsibility of your team to moderate and ensure that whatever's coming through has been thoroughly tested, that it's been looked at, and that it's adding value. Um, ideally also, you want documentation, you want commenting on the code. This is good practice, and it's actually, it actually helps the next person in line um, contribute even more and perhaps, um, you know, make it better. I wanna kinda of close out today. Um, this is supposed to be a short talk, but I've gone over a little bit. Um, with the, the code of conduct that, that GSA and code.gov recently um, developed and, and um, published. Um, this is something that I think would be useful for anybody in the, in the coding community to, uh, use. Of course, we had to go through our legal department to ensure that this was something that we could use, the code of conduct. But it basically makes um, code, cr crowdsourcing code, sharing um, a place in an, an environment that's a, it's a positive environment. It's somewhere that um, participants can expect certain um, good behavior. 
and it's uh it's just a good thing to have in place before you go about any type of crowdsourcing or any type of open source development so um, we have this available on code.gov um, i can show it to you in a moment but i just wanted to bring this up as something that people oftentimes perhaps forget about but it's definitely necessary um, just to provide a, an even even ground even footing even foot ground so that people can work together in in, in, a, in a collaborative fashion so that's it that's all i got um, happy to uh, take questions um, happy to you know talk with you and help you develop open tasks and perhaps make your uh, projects a little bit more rich in terms of uh, helping people and wanting people to contribute to it. You can always access us by emailing us at code at gsa.gov. We're on Twitter, code.gov is our handle. We have a Slack channel that um, it's called Open Source Public. If you're a new to the open source community, please join. We, you know, we, we publish articles there. We talk about uh, new developments. It's a great place to just you know, learn and meet your fellow colleagues. Uh, of course, we have a newsletter. We have a listserv group. If you have a .miller.gov address, please go ahead and sign up, or send the send that send the email to listserv at listserv.gsa.gov, um, and subscribe code in the body. You can always reach out to me. My name is Amin Mayer. Um, I am amin.mayer at gsa.gov, and we're on all the social media, of course. Um, so that that being said, um, I'm gonna I think open the floor to some questions. I believe Nikki yes. is moderating those. So Nikki, please. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, you can put your questions into the group chat. Um, we do have a question from ACR. They ask, are, are you aligning those code repositories for mission support activities to USSM's federal integrated business framework? That's um, the Unified Shared Services Management. That's a good question. So I do not believe that we are, um, but I will note that. That's, a, that's very interesting. I did actually used to work with them. So I will reach out to USSM to see how we can, how we can get that across to them as well. Thank you for that. Okay, um, so how, um, in the presentation, I mean, you showed how um, the open tasks are, are divided up by skill level and time. How is that determined? Is that something that is determined by the person that, that is um, putting the open task up on, on the website, or is, is there some other metric that, that determines that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Sometimes that can be a little subjective um, based on the person who is, I guess, moderating the, the project. You know, they may think that a skill level is medium versus, or sorry, intermediate versus advanced versus beginner. And I think that kind of plays itself out when they notice that people aren't really contributing to it or they are unable to answer a question or solve a problem that that, that open task may entail. So. Luckily, the labels can be edited at any time. So if you notice that a project is not getting much traction, um, maybe it's because you're awesome and <laughs> not everybody's up to your level. So I always encourage people to maybe not to bring it down a notch and say like, this project is perhaps for a beginner and the skill level might be low or vice versa. If beginners are not able to attack that problem, let's bump it up and say, this is, an, this is good for intermediate support and maybe the, the amount of time this might take is a little bit longer. So it's, it's a little subjective. Ideally, if a, a code repository or a project is maintained by somebody who's been working on it for a long time or has a lot of experience, they're usually able to gauge what that experience level might be. But that's a good question. Okay, um, just a reminder, keep uploading those questions. Um, do people usually tackle the open, open tasks uh, individually or in, in a group? Like, yeah, good question. Um, it's usually a group effort, um, but it usually starts with one, um, one person kind of like initiating the request or initiating the work. That sometimes um, will encourage others to be less shy and jump into a, a problem. Um, I've noticed that 
once an issue or a pull request has been made on a particular project, that kind of opens the floodgates for others to start jumping in there. So if you're somebody who um, is looking around and you don't see many people, don't be discouraged. I would say, um, you know, just you know, ask a question within within the code repository through an issue, um, and you never know. You might it might catalyze others to to jump in there with you. But we we typically like to see collaboration across um, not only government but also the private sector as well. So um, you know, when you worked on pro when you work on a project together, it really it's a good learning opportunity and it also uh, familiarizes yourself with other people's projects as well. Okay, um, we have a follow up question to the first question um, from ACR. Adding to the question on USSM and the FIBN, if one agency created code for repeatable back office task, which is a specific process or sub process in the FIBN, then the code could be a robust starting point for other agencies to leverage. I guess that's more of a yeah, absolutely. If that's a comment, that's a true comment. Comment. Yeah. We've uh, we an interesting example that's going on right now is um, there is the virtual foreign student VSFS. Uh, I'm trying to remember virtual foreign student. Um, it's basically like an internship that the State Department has, where um, they're basically opening up their portal and making it open source so that other folks and in, in either agencies or other uh, national countries can use that shell of a project to you know create a similar service so it the point of open source is always to reduce duplication um, because we have a lot of that in government and that's something that you know impacts you know price it impacts um, you know personnel and everything related okay uh, we have another question how is code.gov collaborating with other AI or RPA initiatives if at all yeah, so that's a good question. So code.gov was actually, was actually uh, a part of developing guidance from OMB recently on AI and, R and RPA projects. What we're, what we're hoping to do um, once that policy comes out, hopefully soon, is when somebody creates a project or a repository that they'll be required to tag it um, on their JSON file, which we harvest, um, whether it's an AI project or not. So ideally in the future, when the guidance does come out and you want to search for AI projects or RPA related projects or any ML projects on code.gov, there'll be a tag for that as well. And that will bubble up to the top. Um, that's TBD, but that's kind of the vision. Okay. Um, what agencies, uh, I mean, do you think utilize the open task section and what do you think you know the benefits have been for those agencies um to you know share their their code and sure. solutions through through our website yeah so so far i think the top three have been uh gsa and that's i think a product of, because we're the code.gov team rests within gsa and um we have a sounding board there but also DOD and CFPB are, have been the, the other two agencies that have been utilizing open tasks. Uh, CDC is also in there and a, and a couple others are in there as well. Um, we're hoping to you know, grow it, but I would say those three are the top ones so far. Okay, are there any other questions? I was gonna do a quick demo, if that's okay, if folks are still on the line. Uh, to quickly check out how to, you know, create a tag uh, or a label. If if people want to see that, I can show you real quick. Um, so basically, hopefully, folks can see. I'm in a I'm in the code.gov API um, issue page right now on GitHub, and if I scroll down and I find an issue, say this is this one is wrong documentation link link, and I click on it. Um, over here on the right hand side, you can see where I can add labels to this particular project. So I start typing in, and there's code.gov in there, or you know, help wanted. So it's 
basically what I'm trying to show you is really easy to do this stuff um, and will automatically pull that into code.gov and display it for you for crowdsourcing purposes. Um, and then the other thing is with respect to the code, the code of conduct, uh, where it sits on code.gov's uh, main repository page is right in the same place as the README, the license files, and the contributing docs. So it's right above here. And that's where it, that's a good place to put it. So if you if you had any questions on where it belongs, that's that's probably a good place. You can put it on every page if you want or every repository, but this is probably a good starting point. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Um, if not, I'd just like to remind you to please follow us at code.gov on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Uh, we also have a Medium page where we post blogs. Um, today is Clean Out Your Computer Day. So please come and help us clean out some of these open tasks. Um, we welcome you to come and, and visit and, and uh, check out some of the things that we're talking about. It's also National Inventors Day and it is Safer Internet Day. So we love to promote these, these days, these international days. It's also International Women and Girls in STEM Day. So um, again, we thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll make sure that there are no other housekeeping things that we must do. Um, please, um, please continue to follow us and make sure you follow challenge.gov as well and digital.gov. Thank you for joining us and we'll talk to you soon.